Hi, this is Jason Bayless, and this is the first time we're on location with a Radical Guide, and we're going to Oakland, California. In this episode, we are meeting up with a Radical publisher, PM Press. We're sitting down with a co-founder and several of the employees who keep the books flowing and the promotions going. Thank you for joining us. Let's go. the backstory of PM, uh, it's fair to say nothing exists in a vacuum. And so before PM was ever a twinkle in my eye, I'd already been involved in this dissemination of ideas, shall we say, for several decades before that. So I, um, I first discovered punk rock and anarchism in 1979 when I was age 13. And pretty much ever since then, uh, I've been involved in those kind of activities. Uh, shortly after that, I started distributing stuff. I was a product of the, the kind of uh, anarcho-punk underground. This is back in the UK, so in the late 70s, early 80s. And at that time, there was a very vibrant um, DIY scene, I guess you'd call it. Again, DIY meaning do it yourself, which is a terrible misnomer. Since we weren't doing it ourselves as atomized individuals, we were actually doing it in concert with others. But I guess D I C O, whatever, it's not quite a snappy acronym. But uh, so at the, at the same time as I was involved with this kind of vibrant underground punk scene, um, through that I also uh, came into contact with other people that were doing. Um, publishing and distributing radical literature. Um, particularly, um, I was at a, a, a crass gig in London, I think in 1981 or something. So I was already distributing literature at that point, so I was the kind of annoying little kid uh, walking around going with a kind of plastic bag full of fanzines saying, do you want to buy a fanzine, mister? To which the typical response was typically, what's a fanzine? And I'd say, oh, it's cool, it's got like crass and UK subs in it and it's only 10p. Um, anyway, there was a bunch of old bearded weirdo guys who were probably about 10 years older than me, but nevertheless, um, they were sitting behind a table at this crass concert and they had a vast array of literature. And even then I thought this is definitely the way to go. That instead of harassing innocent concert goers, kind of people come to you. So I went and started harassing them instead of the concert goers and basically asked them a million and one questions. They were very patient, very kind. And it transpired that they were actually worked at a radical bookstore called Houseman's in London, which actually still exists. And through Houseman's, they were also involved in the dissemination of literature, but they were also involved in uh, publishing and distribution. So from that point on, I spent every kind of school holiday going down to London and hanging out at Houseman's and these guys were very generous enough to kind of mentor me in the ways of publishing and distribution um, and provided me the wherewithal to get stuff beyond punk fanzines to distribute. They kind of walked me through and did the, my first publishing efforts were kind of co-publishing with them, etc. And so, you know, I started AK Press and then moved to America and started over here. Um, so basically PM was the next, I don't know if evolution is the right sense, the next sidestep perhaps in that journey of basically doing what I've been doing all my life. So I guess I'm a singularly boring bastard that's been doing the same thing for the last uh, 40 years now. Well, I my, my my twin passions as a kid were, were reading, and I guess hence ideas, and music. So to me, the connection between punk rock and politics was sort of immediate and apparent, but they were both separate. So they were both intertwined. They were the, the, my two big passions. I say by the time I reached 13, you know, my previous passions had been 
probably reading and stamp collecting or reading and playing the recorder. Um, so, I mean, I discovered politics, I presume, through reading. Um, and I was a voracious reader. My parents were not political, but I grew up in a house full of books. My mother in particular was always, wherever my reading took me, was suggesting kind of good stuff. So as a kid, perhaps very typically, I was obsessed with war. So I would read everything I could get my hands on, you know, age from sort of five onwards or whatever. That might be, you know, potted histories of Napoleon or Julius Caesar or Hannibal, or it might be, you know, the Luftwaffe planes in the Second World War or whatever. So what my mother did, given my obsession with war, as I got older, would start saying, well, if you're interested in war, read Catch-22 or read All Quiet on the Western Front or read... So as well as, again, kind of pushing on me the kind of classics of literature, read George Orwell, read Animal Farm, read Aldous Huxley, read Solzhenitsyn one day in the life of Ivan Dzenizovich, read whatever. So I think it's Camus, Sartre, whatever. So I think my understanding and my interest in anarchism, so when I decided I was an anarchist, age 13, I'd never read anything explicitly about anarchism, but nevertheless I'd figured out, I guess, through this jigsaw puzzle of reading the classics of ideas, that I had a fairly sophisticated understanding of anarchism in that I was aware I was an anarchist as opposed to a Marxist or a social democrat or another Labour Party or whatever. At the same time, I say I discovered punk rock, or in a similar time frame, punk rock at the time, um, through Crass and their acolytes, was espousing a particularly bizarre, bastardized form of anarchism. It's fair to say, or at least I would argue. But nevertheless, so I'm kind of my interests dovetailed. So the first anarch explicitly anarchist magazine I bought was because I was on a, a CND, which is the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament March. This would have been again in 1979. So again, as a 13-year-old kid, I was on an anti-nuclear march. At this march was a bunch of punk rockers. You know, they were like damned and st on the back of the other jackets. And they were selling this anarchist newspaper, which was called Extra, which was kind of a forerunner to the likes of Class War. It was, um, whatever, very agitational, had like, extolling the virtues of riots and that kind of thing. So I say I bought this copy of Extra and uh, because it was sold by punks. So I was drawn to whatever the punks were selling. I then bought it because it was a newspaper on anarchism. So the two were kind of connected. And so for me, in terms of selling literature through, the, through and to the punk scene, I was just kind of following my interests. So if I'm interested in politics, it's easy and comfortable and makes sense that I'm going to be drawn to the political aspects of other things that I'm interested in. So I was part of what drew me to punk in particular was the political end of punk, the crasses, etc. And equally, if I'm going to be involved in punk and I'm also interested in politics, then I'm going to be pushing my politics within that punk scene. So obviously I wasn't the first person to, you know, try and sell a fanzine. But, um, and I obviously, given what I said before about meeting these people from Housemans, I wasn't the first person to sell political literature at a punk concert, obviously. But that was, you know, so I was just following my passions. I mean, it wasn't premeditated in that sense. When, when AK Press became more than just me, so I mean, I, I, I have always identified as an anarchist. At the same time, my influences um, and my belief in the, the utility of, of other ideas beyond anarchism has always been vast. So the, growing, growing up as a kid and as a voracious reader, in many ways reading anarchist stuff uh, just kind of made me nod my head metaphorically because to me a lot of anarchism is just kind of common sense so when I was reading the anarchist classics as a kid it was kind of like sure this is just reinforcing or articulating in many ways what I 
already think. Again, not because I'm some child prodigy genius, but because these ideas are basically common sense, that people should are better able to organize their own lives, that authority and hierarchy just gets in the way. But in many ways, it was reading uh, non-anarchist thinkers, which kind of got me thinking beyond, as I say, kind of nodding my head and just sort of agreeing with those ideas and those tenets and those premises. Many of them were, uh, pretty much all of them were Marxists. Many of them were kind of ex-trots, Trotskyists. So it would be, I mean, the, the think, thinkers and writers have probably had the most profound effect on me as a kid, as a teenager, would be kind of Marxists like E.P. Thompson. Uh, again, his book, Making of the English Working Class, is probably the book that I've read most cover to cover in my life, probably read it half a dozen times. And it's really fundamental to my, my way of thinking. Uh, people like C.L.R. James, um, uh, Morris Brinton, another ex-trot. And then the other huge influence on me as a teenager was actually reading feminist uh, writings, both uh, fiction and non-fiction. So non-fiction like Simone de Beauvoir, Second Sex, but a lot of reading a lot of fiction. Um, uh, Ursula Le Guin, Marge Piercy, Marilyn French. Again, that really kind of got me thinking beyond the obvious. So while, so AK was and is still, I believe, um, explicitly an anarchist publisher, what it actually published and distributed was a lot wider than that and is a lot wider than that. Um, the difference with PM is that uh, when we set up PM, for better or worse, we thought that the, there was too much baggage attached to the term anarchist and anarchism. Um, and we thought that that would be too limiting and off-putting in terms of reaching the potential audience that we wanted to reach. So I also think it's probably uh, it's fair to say that actually I don't know all the people involved in PM, how they would personally define their politics. I mean, in that sense, it's not really important. I mean, there's not a kind of political litmus test or a political correctness test or whatever to be a part of PM. Um, hopefully, uh, um, the ideas speak for themselves. And of course, much of what we publish similarly with, with AK Press is, is contradictory within itself. I mean, not within itself, within, within the body of work. And that we're putting forward a, a, a bunch of stuff which we think is worth investigating, is worth um, interacting with. It doesn't mean that we agree, of course, with every single word that we've published. I mean, that would be kind of bizarre, I guess. So in terms of, I mean, my, in terms of the organizations that I've been involved with, um, they have all been, that I've been active within, I guess. They've all been kind of anarchist or anarchist inflected organizations. Um, the, so when I set up AK Press, AK Press had kind of three fundamental rules or whatever within its, it had three bylaws beyond the kind of generic, it's a workers co-op, which of course is a meaningless term in the, in the same way that being a corporation is a meaningless term, it's what your actual internal bylaws state. So for AK Press, there was kind of three basic premises or bylaws. One was that there was equal decision making um, uh, process, I guess, one person, one vote. It was not consensus. Uh, second was that everyone was paid the same. And the third was that you entered AK with nothing and you left with nothing. So what that meant in an organizational structure was to try and preserve AK as an explicitly political project. So it meant that in terms of the ownership structure of AK, it was owned by those that worked there. But hence when you, so technically speaking, on paper when you joined AK, you were given a share of which there was no dividends paid upon it. When you left AK, you kind of gave that share back. So it was controlled by, it was a self-managed workplace and owned and controlled by the people that worked there. I still think those three principles are absolutely fine. 
Yeah, I still stand by them. I have no idea if they are still 10 years later. I mean, I don't know about the inner workings anymore of AK Press. What those three principles, while being fine, in terms of collective decision making and organization, the practice of AK over the kind of 20 years that I was doing it made as many organizational problems and questions as they answered. And th there were a number of them. Um, firstly, in terms of one person, one vote doesn't take into account and doesn't weigh uh, knowledge, experience, aptitude, interest. So to give an example of that, um, AKs, again, when I was involved in it, had a process, so decisions on what we published was collectively taken, meaning everyone voted on whatever we published as that was considered to be important. So while there was job, specific job descriptions within AK, everyone got to vote on what AK published. What that meant in practice was AK applied a bunch of criteria to submissions for publishing proposals. They were the criteria based on three, three criteria. Firstly was, was its political merits? Is this a good thing for AK to be publishing? Secondly was financial, or uh, rather meaning do we think that it's something that we could sell? Because obviously it might be the most politically important book in the world, but if we can't sell it, it doesn't really help anyone or anything or the ideas within the book. And thirdly would be how much work would it be entailed to do it? It could be the best book in the world, and it could be the potentially the best selling book in the world, but if it's so badly written, and or the author is such a fucking wanker that we don't think we can work with them, then it'd be in effect impossible, the work to actually produce it would make it. So these are the three criteria. So we'd have two readers of the work and the readers would report back to the wide, the bigger collective basing those three criteria. But often what would happen hence would be the readers would give their reports, which would be like 10 minutes in a collective meeting and then people would vote. So, so the majority vote would often be against the two readers, meaning the two people that actually read the books and made their, you know, somewhat, you know, based on these criteria and so made their educated reasons as to why it should be done. Often the, the majority would say, nah, I don't like it, it sounds stupid, or I'm just not interested in that. So again, it's, it's what I'm trying to say, so how do you weigh interest? How do you weigh aptitude? How do you weigh... Um, so that was, became a problem. Um, everyone being paid the same, everyone having equal decision-making power doesn't deal with things like how do you deal with management. This is one person, one vote. Does that mean that instead of having one boss, you have 10 bosses? Again, at the time that me and AK parted ways, there was 11 people. Does that mean, in effect, that it's the, the tyranny of the majority? Which is what it ended up being. Again, that's a loaded term. But one person, one vote means the majority can do whatever the hell they want. Including, they can rewrite the bylaws, they can do whatever the hell they want. Um, so again, one person, one vote doesn't address that. Everyone being paid the same again, doesn't address management with a small m, or coordination, or self-management. Again, call it what you want. So, again, through the history of my time with, with AK, all kinds of problems arose, typical problems. What do you do when someone comes into work late every day and leaves early and spends half of their truncated workday obviously talking on the phone, making personal calls? So at the time, the way of dealing with that was eventually everyone had had enough and we had a, our, at our morning collective meeting, we basically all went around the circle and said, we don't want to work with you anymore. At which point the, the person accused of these crimes burst into tears and left. Obviously that's not really a sophisticated 
or good way of dealing with, quote, management or, quote, discipline. But what happened was, because of our lack of experience, perhaps, or whatever, is that the default then, in terms of management, in terms of, of discipline, so to speak, or how, again, how you phrase these terms, was the AK tended to default to whatever is the normal practice of these things. Meaning, we defaulted to, okay, discipline is two written warnings and then you're fired. Well, that's what corp the corporate world does. That's not an alternative way of dealing with whatever. The, the, another big problem which grew up at, at AK was there was a, well, once you reach a certain size, and even if you, one has a typical kind of turnover in terms of people that work there, I think the average, again, during my tenure, the average person probably worked at AK for between, say, two to four years. And again, I believe that's sort of fairly typical in terms of job turnover. But what that means, however, for AK, with a collective of 11 people, is that in my last few years there, we were basically continually hiring people or hiring people to join the collective. It also meant that fairly quickly, if you're basically continually hiring people, if you know once or twice a year someone leaves and hence there's a quote job opening, very quickly we went through the kind of pool of everyone that we knew, including that wider pool of you know people that we knew that lived on the other side of the continent or whatever. So it meant that for the last few years that I was at AK, basically AK was hiring strangers, meaning we were doing we were doing resumes, looking at people's resumes of strangers, giving them a 30 or 40 minute interview, and that was the basis of being hired. So hiring, in effect, a bunch of strangers, of course, leads to a whole bunch of other problems, just by the nature of things. Again, you're hiring someone and having them join the collective after six months probation, when you don't know them, they have no experience, whatever. Um, so again, typically having gone through everyone that we knew, the typical person that was hired uh, to AK Press was someone that was fresh out of college, that basically had no experience in doing anything. So the, to, to when, when we started PM, PM was started by three people that used to work at AK. Started by myself and Craig, who were basically fired from AK Press, and another chap who, um, resigned in disgust at our firing. So the three of us, if there was 11 people at AK at the time, the basically the three of us that started PM were, even before we were fired or resigned from the, collect the AK Collective, for several years we'd been the kind of minority faction, for want of a better term. And the basic reason of why PM started was there's only so many years that you can go in an organization where you're kind of pretty consistently outvoted, shall we say. So it doesn't mean that we were right and AK is wrong, but I say we were the kind of minority. So we wanted to do, <laughs> we wanted to be the majority of votes, I guess. So PM started basically, PM started while we were actually still within AK Press. So it preceded um, our departure from AK. Um, the lessons that we took from the AK experience were many. So in terms of the, they were, the main one was that um, given the experiences of working in effect with strangers towards the end of AK Press, the primary rule of PM was we're only going to work with people that we know, people that we know well. And so that takes a lot of the, the problematics and the problems of, of organization, of structure out of the equation. Because if you're working with people that you know well, uh, politically and otherwise, and people that you trust, then the problems and the problematics of management, of oversight, of keeping track, are basically taken out of the picture. So in terms of the formal structures of PM Press, again, everyone is paid the same. Uh, we also have 
more or less specific job duties. Um, in terms of the ownership structure, uh, PM Press is owned by myself and Craig. We have five shares each. Again, there's no dividends paid on the shares or whatever. So insofar as we're a corporation and we have to issue shares, that's the ownership structure. In terms of the decision making that happens, there is some coordination of certain tasks, which again is often done by myself and Craig of some of the big picture stuff. Beyond that, everyone pretty much works autonomously. I say with no oversight. That, of course, is perhaps not ideal for everyone. It's not everyone's, I mean, so hence to work at PM, you have to be a self-motivated person that's able to work typically in isolation alone. Since other than Dan that works at the warehouse, Everyone works at home as their base. So you have to be comfortable, I guess, with working without supervision and doing your own thing. I mean, in many ways, it's a weird confluence of, if you like, anarchist ideas and practice, but it's actually what the corporate world aspires to, particularly these days with their kind of decentralized structures and you know, I mean, ideally, presumably, Apple, etc., want self-motivated people to do their own thing. I guess the difference is that then the, the surplus value of their labor goes to Apple shareholders, not to the people that work there. Um, but so there's no, uh, there's very few meetings. There's lots of email and there's lots of one-on-one -on -one phone conversations, there's virtually no meetings and there's virtually no group decisions. So various people take decisions if it's within their sphere of operations. And loosely speaking, myself and Craig will take some of the bigger decisions. You know, I mean, me and Craig decide whether we can afford a wage rise or a bonus every year, I guess, would be a big decision. Um, when there's a equally wide decisions, we've, the larger group has decided, do we want a wage rise or do we want to pay health care, I guess, was a group decision. People opted for a, a wage rise as opposed to ha having health care. But I say beyond that, the decisions are taken, I guess, in that classic anarchist fashion by those who are affected by that work. And so we, we, we publish and distribute books. I mean, the books we distribute are the books that we also publish. So we act as our own distributor as well as having more mainstream corporate distribution. So in terms of, and we do have more or less, so these are of course sometimes overlapping, we have job descriptions. So Dan does shipping and receiving in the warehouse. Um, Stephanie does publicity in the website. We have two full-time copy editors. Uh, we have a full-time events person. Um, so everyone is responsible for their own work. Obviously, everyone's work impacts each other. Um, but the, 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 the immediate decisions of, any, of everyone's work is taken by themselves. Insofar as that work overlaps, then those decisions may be taken in consultation with those that it directly affects. So in terms of the workflow of the, of the production, so those decisions will be taken by the overall editors or the project managers, which would, it would typically be myself or Craig. So they'll be taken in consultation with the copy editors. You know, here's what we have coming up, what scheduling look like. So in terms of people's works, um, so similarly, that would be taken with, you know, but uh, as, I, as I mentioned previously, the, the, the key principle, I think, at PM Press is that everyone that works at PM has a prior history. 
obviously not with PM, since PM had to start at some point, but we all knew each other, and we or, and or knew of each other's work. So everyone that joined, actually also everyone that joined PM, with the exception, I think, of, of one person, started as a volunteer, since PM literally started with nothing. So including myself and Craig, everyone worked for free initially. And then once certain people started getting a, a, a modest wage, and I think my initial wage was $400 a month, was my first wage, at PM Press, but still, as, in, as new people came on, they also started as volunteers. So not only did we know them previously, and hence know... So there's never been a political debate within PM, because again, everyone that's work, that comes on to work at PM is already a known quantity. So there's never been any controversy of how the fuck could we end up publishing this book, or this is terrible, or I can't believe we're doing this, because we're already on the same page. Or certainly, we're working out of the same book, if not on the same page necessarily. So that's never been an issue. Similarly, in terms of working together, insofar as we work together, in, so in terms of being pieces of the, jig of the jigsaw that makes up that bigger picture, there's not really an issue. And it's actually quite the opposite. When Stephen joined um, PM, his only question was, do I have to attend meetings or is there meetings? And we said, actually, there's not. He said, great, I'm in then. So again, it's that, I don't know. Uh, and our ability to do that is because we're working with people that we know and people similarly that we have a history with. So we're not starting it, you know. We've already got past a lot of assumptions, a lot of presumptions. You know, we're not starting at one, we're already starting at, you know, we're already starting at 11, man, in terms of turn it up to 11 with everybody. So there's not, there doesn't have to be, so the learning curve at PM is purely about learning one's job and how one's job fits into that bigger picture. It's not learning anything else, it's not learning... Um, so again, that's not necessarily a model that can be replicated, but it's, it's our way of sidestepping the ever-present and ever-thorny issues of collective self-management of whatever. So I mean, it's, it's a blueprint, which I think has worked very well. I mean, I think uh, there's only been of people that were on the payroll at PM, there's only ever been two people that have left PM. So the fact we're now... Blah, eight or nine people on the payroll. Um, and we've been going for 10 years. So our turnover has been, you know, one person in every five years has left. Um, both of whom we're still on very good terms with and still work with PM. So, in that sense, you know, the model works for us. As a kid and still today, and I think it's obviously, by definition, anyone and everyone that works at PM, we still to cling to an old-fashioned concept that actually ideas matter. And not only do ideas matter, but hopefully ideas matter because they can help us shape our world, preferably for the better. Secondly, not only do ideas matter, but ideas don't exist in a vacuum. And hence, history matters. Ideas don't just appear fully formed and perfectly formed out of nowhere. That the ideas, like dear old anarchism, are a process. And they're not only a process, but they're a, an ongoing process. I mean, I like the metaphor, which again, which I didn't come up with, but ideas or, an, or anarchism, for that matter, are like a river. The river is ever flowing, and the river is always changing and mutating over time. 
There are streams which feed into that river. There are streams which go out of that river. The river over, you know, over millennia changes course. But it's a, it's a living organic process. And to me, that's the importance of history. That's the importance of ideas. Uh, again, the beauty of anarchism is that anarchism to me is a melding of theory and practice. It's not, a, it's not a rigid set of absolutes. I mean, one of the problems for all that I love many Marxists and Marx himself, anarchism is one of the few ideologies which is not named after a person. It's not Leninism, it's not Maoism, it's not Marxism. And hence, there is not one holy book which, which forever has to be interpreted or reinterpreted or the correct interpretation of the holy scriptures which I think is a real problem with much of political ideology, if you like, or many political ideas, is you're trying to fit reality into those ideas and those conceptions or preconceptions or misconceptions of those ideas. Whereas to me, anarchism and ideas, I say, are this kind of process. And by necessity, process is never-ending and process changes. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, it's the stuff of life. That's why I think it's important. I mean, in many ways, you know, you're saying what am I most proud of is be like asking who's your favorite child. You know, it's uh, you can't. Uh, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm extremely proud of what, what, what we have done and what we are doing. Uh, I think particularly in I mean, all my life, well, I mean, I think what we, what we have achieved and what you're achieving is particularly important because if nothing exists in a vacuum, everything we've done has been at a time where social movements have been in, hopefully not terminal, but have been in decline. You know, the high point, the last high point of social movements was in the 60s, which actually means the early 70s. That was also the high point for literature and ideas. It was the birth of much literature and ideas. So in the 60s, you not only had the birth of black power or black liberation, but hence black literature. Not the birth of black literature, obviously James Baldwin predated, but in terms of that concept, Similarly, there was not only the women's movement emerged out of the 60s, but hence women's literature. And there literally was not women's fiction to speak of before the 60s. Similarly with gay liberation and hence gay literature. I mean, gays did not exist formally, legally before the 60s. So again, so obviously hence neither did gay literature, fiction or non-fiction. Um, so I say that was kind of, in many ways, the high point. And obviously social movements beget and play into and are part of that process of ideas and vice versa. So all of my active life from the late, uh, late 70s onwards has been a time of massive decline of social movements. And we've actually been desperately trying to cling on to the gains and what's left of those social movements. And that's definitely true in terms of, of the dissemination of literature and ideas. I mean, the book trade, whether it's radical or mainstream, is, is dying. But it has been dying for the last 40 years. Which is a long way of saying, I think, our achievements of what we've been able to do given that context is, is pretty impressive. So I'm very proud of that. Personally, it's been exciting for me to be able to work with and publish many of the people that when I was a kid had a profound influence on my life. So, you know, personally speaking, it was kind of cool and exciting to be able to work with Mari Butchin or Noam Chomsky or Le Ursula Le Guin or Marge Piercy, despite her um, idiosyncrasies, shall we say, in the case of Ms. Piercy. But, you know, so to be able to kind of work with people that had a profound influence on, on me and my ideas and my intellectual and personal growth has been fantastic. And similarly to be able to 
if we think that ideas matter. I mean, if you're looking at the glass half full, I mean, rather half empty, I think much of what we do is a kind of, is depressing because it's an archival process. As we're in these times when there is no mass social movements, we're keeping ideas alive, literally, by keeping them in print and making them available to the tiny, tiny, let's be honest, tiny amount of people that actually come across them. I mean, you know, we typically, if our books, you know, if, if we sell four or 5,000 books, that's a bestseller. And that's tiny and insignificant and pathetic in the grand scheme of things. So even our bestsellers, in many ways, what we're doing is keeping the flame alive. But that's all we're doing. But hence, I think that's a vitally important contribution. Because, so I say, in my, if I want to be depressed about it, I think we're this kind of, it's sad that we're this desperate archival project. If we don't do it, no one will. And that's certainly the case of many venerable publishers, which are in effect ceasing to exist. A lot of the anarchist and radical classics that we're doing are because 10, 20, 30 years ago, they were done by Freedom Press or Charles H. Kerr, and these people are not really functioning anymore. I think that's terrible. So, you know, I'm glad we're doing it. And uh, apparently we can't single-handedly start a mass movement which is going to change society. But what we can do is keep this kind of small contribution. We are still this little, little stream running into that big river, which will hopefully soon enough will burst its banks and we'll be getting on with it.